Hey there, how's it going everybody? In this video, I'd like to answer some of the most common questions that I get on this channel. Uh, so if you've ever looked at the comment section of my videos, then you may have seen some of these because they tend to pop up a lot. Uh, I also get a lot of these within personal messages as well. Now, uh, if you'd like to jump forward to any specific question and answer, then I'll go ahead and put each question in the description section below and also the time that you can jump to for each answer. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so first of all, the most common question that I get is what text editor that I'm using in my videos. And the text editor that I'm using is Sublime Text with a custom theme. And this is Sublime Text here, and if you watch my videos, this probably looks familiar. Um, now, the custom theme that I use is called Predon. Now, I've been using Sublime Text for some time now, and I really like it. Now, I do have a video where I walk through how I installed and set up my Sublime Text. Um, now, the packages that I go over in that video are kind of focused more around web development than Python programming. But if you just want to see how I set up the color theme and things like that, then that's a good one to watch. Now, I've been meaning to uh, create another video where I walk through a Python-specific setup using Sublime Text, but I haven't quite got around to that yet. And speaking of Sublime Text, another common question that I get is how I'm running my Python code from within Sublime Text. So Sublime Text has these build systems that they use to execute code from different programming languages. And you can see the build systems. If I go to tools and build system here, then you can see that they list all of these languages here. Now, you might notice that your Sublime Text has this set to automatic. Now, depending on how you're using Python and Sublime, uh, you may need to create a custom build system. Uh, I always make custom build systems because I like to be able to quickly switch between different ver versions of uh, Python and also between different Python virtual environments. Now, I have a separate, separate video on specifically how I set up these build systems if anyone is curious how I did that. Okay, now another question that's along the same lines as those first two is which IDE or text editor I recommend for other people to use. Uh, so just because I use Sublime Text in my videos, that doesn't necessarily mean that I recommend that other people use it. Uh, the reason that I use Sublime Text in my videos is because it has this very and simple clean layout that allows me to hide just about everything except for the code and the output. Um, so it really allows the uh, viewer on the videos to focus on just the code and nothing else. Um, but with that said, I don't necessarily think Sublime Text is superior to uh, the other options that are out there. So I've heard great things about the Atom text editor, uh, which is kind of similar to Sublime Text, but apparently it comes with some package management stuff that's built in. Um, as far as IDEs go, there's a lot of good reasons someone would prefer an IDE over a text editor because uh, most IDEs have great code hinting and pop-up documentation that allows you to quickly find what you're looking for instead of needing to uh, get on Google and uh, Google method names and things like that. Um, also, they have a lot more in-depth debugging features that allow people to pause the code uh, in the middle of its execution and inspect exactly each variable and what it's assigned to and things like that. Now, as far as IDEs go, it sounds like most people enjoy using PyCharm. Now, I have PyCharm installed on this machine, but I haven't really had a chance to uh, learn how to navigate through it yet, so I can't really speak with much experience as to how good it is. But uh, I've heard it praised by so many people that I think it's safe to assume that it's one of the best IDEs out there for Python programmers. Now, at my current full-time job, uh, we all use the Eclipse um, IDE here with the PyDev plugin for Python development. Now, I know a lot of people kind of have some mixed feelings about Eclipse. Um, some people love it and some people hate it. Uh, I'm kind of indifferent to, uh, to Eclipse, so I don't necessarily love it or hate it. I think it can be overly complicated as far as the layout goes, but once you learn how to use it, then it can have some useful features. Uh, so I do have a separate video on how I set up my Eclipse environment with the PyDev plugin so that you can run Python code. Now, some people have asked me to do a similar video on how to install and set up PyCharm, uh, but the only reason I haven't done that is because I really feel like the videos that the creators of PyCharm have put, put together are way better than anything that I could uh, do myself. So instead, I usually try to point people in the direction of those videos. But, uh, you know, honestly, whenever it comes to uh, text editors or these IDEs, I think it really comes down to personal preference. Uh, I found a balance that I like, but there's still some people out there who love using Emacs or Vim or things like that. Um, I would say whatever allows you to write code at a faster pace without things getting in your way, then that's what I would recommend. 
Um, so if you use something that has a lot of features, and you, then uh, you're going to want to make sure that those features are helping you write your code more quickly and just aren't getting in the way. So I'm not sure if that fully answers that question, um, but really I just think that it depends on personal preference and that you should just try out different ones and get familiar with them and see exactly what you like. Okay, and another common question that I get whenever I do videos like this is how I get these slideshows to work like this within the browser. Now, this is a project called Reveal.js, and I'm on the website here. You can see that they have a test presentation and things like that. Um, but really, uh, this just is for the presentation, but if you actually wanna go to the project, then that's over here on GitHub. It's at github.com slash hakimel at reveal.js. Now, I started using this because I saw a couple of people who are using it in some conference videos, and I thought the concept seemed pretty interesting. Now, it does have a slight learning curve because your entire slideshow is in HTML, um, but it has a lot of features that I like, so I've started using it for almost all of my slideshow presentations. Now, if you do look at the GitHub page here for that project, then it does give you a good walkthrough for how you can download this and get started with installing it and using it. Okay, uh, another question that I get a lot is what Python books that I recommend. Uh, so I don't really have a terrific answer for this because uh, I've always been the kind of person who learns better from watching videos and looking through documentation and examples and things like that. Uh, but I have read two Python books that helped me out a lot. So those are about the only two that I can recommend. Uh, so when I first started writing Python, I got the book uh, Learning Python by Mark Lutz. Now this is a really big book. Uh, I've never read the entire thing. But it has so much information that if you ever had any questions or anything that you didn't quite understand, then I could always just go to the table of contents. And there was usually like an entire chapter devoted to the concept that was giving me trouble. Um, so I'd say that this book is for beginners to intermediate. So if you already consider yourself an intermediate programmer, then you may learn things uh, from this book. But uh, you may get more out of this second book that I recommend. And that second book is Fluent Python by... Luciano Ramaljo. Now this is more of an intermediate to advanced level book. Uh, he gets more into data types, design patterns, uh, good Pythonic code, and things like that. Um, now I know that there are likely a ton of other great Python books out there, but like I said, I'm uh, kind of the person who learns more from videos and walkthroughs, uh, so I haven't really read through a lot of books that are out there. Um, but I did find that these two books were very useful for me. Um, but if you have any book recommendations that helped you out a lot, then feel free to mention those in the comment section below. And maybe I'll post a link to those in the description section. Okay, so another question that I get a lot is why I don't answer more comments. Um, now, I wanted to bring this up because I wanted everyone to know that uh, YouTube has been having some trouble with their comment system for some time now. And now I read pretty much every comment that I get and will usually try to respond to as many as possible. Um, but lately I've been running into this problem where I'll write out a long response and I have a screenshot of some of these, um, but I'll write out a really long response uh, to a comment and then I go to post it. And then you can see down here, this little red arrow here, comment failed to post. Now that's really frustrating for me too, because uh, sometimes it'll take me a lot of time to write out a response and sometimes I can't even post it. Now sometimes it'll work if I reload the page and try again and sometimes it doesn't. So uh, this is an issue that I suspect will get sorted out with YouTube in the near future. Um, but for now, if you write me a comment um, and I don't answer, then there's a chance that I tried to respond and that I got uh, this comment failed to post error. So hopefully that'll get sorted out soon and I won't run into uh, those issues as often. Now, another common question that I get a lot is uh, people asking how they can get a job working in Python. And this doesn't, isn't only for Python, I guess it goes for any programming language. Um, but I guess the best advice that I can give is to have some sample code or projects available on um, you know, something like GitHub or on a personal website so that you can point potential employers to some of your work. Now, if you already have something like that, then I would say that the next step would be to get in touch with the employers. Um, so I'd recommend, you know, trying out websites like Hired.com. Now, I've never personally used Hired, uh, but I have heard that they do a good job of getting people in touch with employers, and they even offer signing bonuses if you do get a position. Now, if there's a specific company or organization that you're interested in, 
then I would check out their website specifically for a list of open positions. Um, or you can email their HR department for possible positions that might not even be open yet. Um, now, I do have a video on how to prepare for an entry-level Python interview. Um, it just goes over some of the basics of what to expect in a first interview. Um, I have had some requests to put together a video on how to prepare for a more advanced Python position, and I marked that down as a video that I'd like to put together in the future. Okay, so next question. Um, so should I learn Python instead of, you know, fill in the blank, whatever language? Um, so I get a lot of questions about people asking for career advice. So people will ask me whether they should learn Python over JavaScript or C++ or Java, or if they should do front-end development or back-end development, and all kinds of questions like that. Um, so really, uh, this just isn't a question that anyone can answer but you. Um, everyone likes different things. Um, I used to program in JavaScript full-time as a front-end developer making web applications. Um, and then I started uh, programming in Python, doing more server-side development. And I like that a lot more. But that was my experience and my own personal preference. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of people out there would have had opposite feelings. So my best advice here would be to do your best to get exposed to as much as you can and not be afraid to get out of your comfort zone. Um, it's really easy to just stick to what you know, uh, but maybe someday, you know, you'll have to set up a web server or something like that and just really realize that you love Linux system, and system administration. Um, you'll never know unless you're exposed to it at some point. And uh, the field of computer science is growing so fast and quickly, and it's so broad that it's difficult to even uh, give a starting point to these types of questions. Um, I mean, I had trouble deciding exactly which path I wanted to go down also, um, and I still consider switching focus to different areas at some point. Um, so again, I would just say to try a little of everything that computer science has to offer and see if anything really ignites a passion that you didn't know that you had. So some of the more uh, exciting and growing fields within computer science right now, um, you know, you have machine learning, artificial intelligence, data science, uh, systems administration, front-end development, back-end development, and there's just a ton of others. And you can even find a lot of jobs where you're going to be responsible for multiple roles. And positions like that can be intimidating because, uh, you know, you have to learn more, but it can also help with exposing you to those areas uh, that you later discover that you did want to focus on. Now, one thing that I always try to emphasize is that no matter which path you take, it will always be beneficial to have a firm grasp on some computer science fundamentals. So things like algorithms and data structures and design patterns and things like that. And also, uh, one more thing is that if you ever do choose a field that doesn't make you happy, then don't let yourself stay there for too long. Uh, you should definitely move on and try something else because you're going to be most happy when you find something that you're really passionate about and something that you're proud to be working on. Okay, so this will be the last question of the video. Uh, it's another one that's kind of focused on career advice. And I'm kind of surprised that I get this one as often as I do. But I get asked by a lot of people on here whether they are too old to learn programming or if they're too old to get a full-time job in programming. Now, I wanted to answer this one because this is a pretty common thing for people to ask themselves. Um, so sometimes it's easy to believe that everyone in computer science got started when they were young. Um, like if you listen to programming podcasts and things like that, uh, it seems like every guest mentions how they got started with programming when they were like eight years old by taking apart calculators and reprogramming them into uh, computer games and, and crazy things like that. Um, so then you kind of get stuck with this feeling that you just don't have a chance of catching up to these people uh, when you're just getting started at your age. So if you're in your 20s or your 30s or your 40s or even older, it always feels like you're playing catch up to everyone else. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about how I got started because I wasn't one of these people who started when I was super young. Um, I went to college for computer science, but I really only did enough to get by and pass the test. I wasn't really taking it all in at the time. Um, now, I'm not going to give my exact age now, but it wasn't really until my late 20s that I really buckled down and got serious about learning uh, programming in depth. And after I really started to get serious about learning these things, I always kicked myself for not taking it more serious at a younger age. So I'd be like, man, if I'd only been this dedicated back in college, then I'd be so much better than I am right now. Um, but I found that after I started making these videos that I would get messages from 
people who were in high school, and they would be asking if it was too late for them to learn because everyone that they know started out like before they were teenagers. And I was always amazed that these high school kids would think that they were too far behind. So at about that point, that's when I kind of realized that you're always going to find people who started out younger or who have more experience, and there's nothing that you can do about that. But that doesn't mean that it's too late for you to get started. So if programming is something that you enjoy and you keep at it, then after a while, you're just going to start to pick up more and more. Um, so when I really buckled down and started trying to learn this stuff, it really only took me about a year or two to get to the point where I felt like I could really contribute to projects that I cared about. Um, so it doesn't take very long to reach that initial stage to where you can you know, get a job and start doing some good work. So I usually tell people of any age that if they really enjoy programming, that it's almost never too late to get started. Um, so let's say that you're, you know, somebody who's 50 years old. Um, well, if you dedicate yourself and push yourself to learn these things, then I honestly think that you could get an entry level job uh, by the time you turn 51. And that's not to say that you get that entry level position and you're completely done. I mean, it's a job that requires constant learning and adapting. And when you take a job like this, you're signing yourself up for a lifetime of learning new skills and technologies. Um, but hopefully that's part of the reason that you love it and why you want to do it for a living. So I know that was a long answer to that question, uh, but I do get that a lot. So I kind of wanted to give some encouragement there. Um, so I think that's going to do it for this video. Uh, if anyone has any additional questions or if I didn't answer any of these adequately, then uh, just feel free to comment down below and I'll do my best to answer any additional questions. And if you enjoy these tutorials and would like to support them, uh, then there are several ways you can do that. Uh, the easiest way is to simply like the video and give it a thumbs up. And also, it's a huge help to share these videos with anyone who you think would find them useful. And if you have the means, then you can contribute through Patreon, and there's a link to that page in the description section below. Uh, be sure to subscribe for future videos, and thank you all for watching.